We look again now at verses 1 and 2 of 1 Peter 1, and one of these phrases is so pregnant with wonderful meaning, I don't think we'll be able to move beyond it. We'll see. I think we may need a third session on these two verses. And I'm talking about the phrase, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So, Father, I pray as we try to get at the way Peter has put this salutation together, and particularly this marvelous reality of being foreknown, I pray for understanding and light and hearts that leap up with appropriate affection concerning this privilege. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, now come three prepositional phrases. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. So, it is a remarkable, large, complex salutation. And the big question is, what what is Peter trying to do with these three prepositional phrases? One, uh, two, three. So that's what we want to try to figure out. Why does he make his greeting? Why doesn't he just say, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the elect exiles, may grace and peace be multiplied to you, and then to, then get into all of this? Why, why pack it into the first sentence and separate your first part of the greeting from the last part of the greeting by all of this dense, theologically laden uh, words? Well, let's just take one of them. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So what, what, what do all these modify? According to, for, and in. They all go back here either to elect or elect exiles. So I'm writing to you who are elect exiles, and that elect exile status accords with something. It is in something. It is for something. That's, that's the idea. But we'll, we'll come back to try to be more precise about that in a minute. Is it election that's being modified by these prepositional phrases? Or is it their exile status? Or is it both together somehow? So what does he mean by according to the foreknowledge of God the Father? What, what is meant by foreknowledge here? Now, to answer that question... You could just guess because it might mean knowing before, or you could look to see if the term foreknowledge or something like it is used elsewhere in First Peter. That's a great strategy to make sure you're thinking an author's thoughts. And so there is a place, just one other place in First Peter, to a little while later, namely here in chapter 1, verses 18 to 20. Let's look at this. You were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, he, Christ, was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest. So he was made manifest in the last time. So foreknown before the foundation of the world, made manifest, appearing in history, in time, in these last times, for the sake of you who through him are believers in God. So what does, what does foreknow mean here? Christ is foreknown, because in, in all likelihood, it's similar to what he, we saw in, in verse 2. Well, is it that uh, here's God in eternity... And here's, here's history in time that unfolds. 
And is God standing here in eternity and and looking forward for knowledge in time and seeing and knowing uh, Christ here? Because he would be here. And um, in that sense, he knows him before because he sees him in in time. No, that's not that's not the way Peter is thinking here. And the clue that it's not is that this is this made manifest here. He's foreknown here, and then he is made manifest in time. So that the, the foreknowing happens here between uh, God the Father and God the Son. And since the Father knew the Son ahead of time here, he manifested him here. Now the question is, well, what does that mean? What, what does it mean that he foreknew him here in eternity, and then manifested him in time. And to get at that, we need to just broaden out our understanding of the biblical use of the of the idea of no or for no. So let's look at let's look at a few passages like Genesis four one. Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. So knowing here is uh, is have sex with right. He he knew her. In other words, this is a this is a circumlocution for the kind of intimate um, relationship between a husband and a wife. So, no takes on a kind of sense of uh, to know intimately, to know uniquely, to know in a committed way. And then look at the use here in. Uh, Genesis eighteen eighteen. Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed with him, for I have known him. Almost all the English versions try to help us with this by translating it chosen. It's clearly yada. I have known him that he may command his children, which means not that I had sex with him, but that was a pointer, namely, I, I have set my favor and my... Um, um, awareness. I have taken note of him and done it in such a way that he's mine now from all the peoples that are on the earth, which is what it says here in Amos about Israel. Hear this word that the word of the Lord, hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known only, well, he, he knows about the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Ammonites and so on. He knows the other peoples, but only Israel does he know. So no here must have that same sense of, I have, I have taken special, close, committed, intimate, personal, relational, knowing, knowledge of you. And here's a text in 1 Corinthians that really sheds light on how we should think about foreknowledge. If anyone loves God, he has been known by God. And that's the right translation with a perfect tense here. If anyone loves God, if you see somebody truly loving God, you know something has happened. They've been known. And he could have said they've been born again or they've been um, elect or they've been saved, or they've been called, but he chose to say they were known. So knowing is something that God does beforehand that brings about their loving God. It's not as though God was sitting or standing in eternity looking forward and finding somebody who loves him so that he could choose him. It's rather, no, if if there is somebody that loves God, they already have been known by God, and so foreknowledge is something Let's go back here to Jesus. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Here in eternity, the Father set his knowing favor, his awareness, his intimate, committed love upon the Son and made him uh, the unique one to be made manifest then 
in the last time. And if we go back here to 1 Peter 1 and say, what is he saying? That we are elect exiles according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Well, if you just isolate the elect and say, elect, that doesn't work so well because foreknowledge has come to mean almost um, identical with elect. And it wouldn't make sense to say, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect according to the election of God the Father. So foreknowledge here in election don't relate that way, it seems. Here's what I suggest. You think about it. I think Peter is helping these people understand who they are in a very hostile world by saying, you are exiles on the earth and you are identified as elect exiles. So he's talking about their present identity as elect exiles. That's who you are. I want you to have strong confidence. That's who you are. You are elect and you are mine. And then he draws attention here to the fact that this present status of elect exiles is rooted in eternity by God's foreknowledge. So this really does amount to the same as eternal election, but he's using it. He's probably using a different word here to stress the intimacy of it and the awareness that God has of them rooted in eternity. So they are presently elect exiles in the dispersion, and he wants them to know that is not something that just began to happen a few weeks ago. That happened in eternity.